Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? When the clouds unfold their wings of strife, when the strong tides lift and the tables strain, will your anchor drift or firm remain? We have an anchor that keeps us so steadfast and sure by the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot hold. Grand and firm. God, uh, you protected us through the week to bring us back again. Help us, Lord. God, um, we live in perilous times. The Bible says we do. And Lord, do we all need you to look out, out for us, Lord, every day. And our families. And, and God, just the regular things that life brings to us, Lord. Sometimes we've got to make tough decisions. Sometimes we don't know what to do. So Lord, I pray you help us to see what you have us to do. And Lord, be with us tonight as we look at your word. And God, we pray with one another. And I pray you will go from this place being glad we were here and worshipped you and was able to talk to you and hear from you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Search me, O God, and know my heart I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me, cleanse me from every sin and set me free. I praise the Lord for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Lord. Thy word is 
prayers Thou wilt supply our need For blessed now, O Lord, I humbly plead Amen. 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 Sorry? 236. <clears throat> Amen. Amazing grace. somewhere at the house that actually has 15 verses to that song. Wow, I knew there was a lot of them. And uh, they haven't sung those in a really long time. Uh, those, those that we sing now, I guess those were uh, the most popular ones people sang, or maybe the ones that the, the hymn book companies printed in their books. I'm not exactly sure how they came to be the standard ones, but uh, now that's about all you can see. I'll uh, turn to Psalm 91. Now, last week uh, I, 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 I gave you the first uh, four points of uh, the, uh, the sermon I call Heads Up. It's stuff that the devil throws at you. And this week we're going to look at the, the last three of them on, on the list here. Um, Psalm 91, uh, let's read uh, verses 1 through 6 again. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Remember those from last week. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, 
nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. And in verse number 10 it says, There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Heavenly Father, help us as we study the rest of these things that we need to watch out for. Uh, God, the, the bombs come falling, God, and uh, we, have to, we have to take a heads up, Lord. And God, uh, look, look out for the attack of the enemy. Help us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, uh, last week we, uh, we talked about recon, which is uh, uh, shortened for the rec reconnoitering. And uh, militaries have done this for a long time. Um, I guess back in the day, uh, it was real easy to reconnoiter. You could sneak through the bushes and uh, you could see the Roman legions down in the valley or, uh, you know, whatever. You could, you could sneak around and see uh, what uh, forces uh, uh, Napoleon had or whatever. Uh, and spies, uh, they probably looked like uh, uh, normal people. But as warfare became exceedingly... Uh, complicated and technical with machinery and all kinds of things. It became harder and harder to really know what the enemy was doing and where he was going and what he was going to do. And so uh, they have all kinds of sophisticated things nowadays. Uh, they have these little drones, you know, that fly around. Uh, and some of those are so small you might not even see them. Um... And uh, then they've got uh, uh, satellites that spy on uh, different things. And believe me, some of those can dial in so close, they can look down at your house and uh, practically count the shingles on your roof. Not quite, but almost. They can tell what color your shingles are. And uh, if you got a dog wandering around the backyard, probably, and what kind of car you had. Uh, and that's, per that's pretty good from outer space. Um, and then there's, of course, I, I imagine there's still old-fashioned kind of reconnoitering that still goes on. So God has done the reconnoitering for us here, and he gives us a heads up on what the devil's throwing at us. Uh, we, we studied last week about the snare of the fowler and the noisome pestilence and the terror by night and the arrows that fly by day. I want you to notice in verse number 6, it talks about it talks about walking pestilence, walking pestilence in in the darkness, no less. Walking pestilence. Now, um, pestilence. Uh, we have a modern shortened form of this. Uh, we call people pests, pests, and, and I suppose some people can be walking pestilences. But I really don't think God is talking about people in this. He, he, but he might be talking about something people do to you. Uh, and I want to say this. Uh, you can be your own worst enemy. Sometimes you can be your own worst pest. You can. You can. Uh, and, and so we have to be careful of the walking pestilence. Um, now notice it's not running. If someone's... Look, if someone's running toward you, you're really going to notice it, probably. Because not many people run toward other people unless they're in a game, football game or something. Uh, but if you're just walking down the street and you see some guy chugging down the same sidewalk you are and he's getting closer by the minute and he's running, you're, you're, you're going to pay attention to that. Hopefully you'll see it. I mean, he may be running so fast you don't see him until he bumps into you and, uh, you know, has you laying on the grass. But uh, uh, this this is a walking. You're going to notice this person or whatever this is coming toward you. First John, First John, uh, chapter number 2, verse 8. It says, again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. Now this is an interesting verse. This basically says that folks that walk in darkness have a real problem. Because that's how you used to walk when you were lost. And if you're a Christian and you're walking in darkness, 
that's an unnatural thing for you to do, Christian. And if someone's coming toward you that's walking pestilence and you're walking around in the darkness, well, you need to turn the light back on. You really do. Uh, he that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So notice that this thing about light and dark for a Christian has to do with your heart attitude toward other people. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So, so why'd you read that? I wanted to show you that a Christian can be in darkness if they try hard enough. It's not a natural state for them to be in. This doesn't mean they lose their salvation. But they've lost their love somehow. And it puts them in a form of darkness. 1 John 1, 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if you're going to have fellowship with God, you're going to have to have love in your heart for your brethren or God's not going to fellowship with you. Now that's clear. Now there's, of course, there's all kinds of other reasons to walk in a little bit of darkness as a Christian. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Notice that worldly people can be walking in darkness also, according to Ephesians. Because they, they're walking in the darkness of this world. We are supposed to give light to this world. We're not supposed to be partaking in the darkness of this world. Um, I was looking at a little uh, old, old movie about Thomas Alva Edison. And it was uh, part of the movie was about him uh, discovering the light bulb. Um, and... Uh, Actually, this did happen. Um, Edison had, uh, you say, did Edison invent the, liber, uh, the light bulb all by himself? No, he didn't. Edison was the first person that had a research laboratory. And he had a couple dozen people working with him at the laboratory uh, that helped him do his experiments and invent stuff. But he got all the credit since he owned all the the patents, and uh, that's how people were back then. You work for someone. I, I think that still kind of goes on today somewhat. Uh, if you work for a company and you invent something, sometimes the company owns it, not you. I know the government used to do that up until very, very recently. But uh, he used to have a spokesman. And uh, it was right after Edison in, and invented the phonograph. And uh, he had been working on the light bulb for a while. And it was pretty well known that he hadn't got there yet. And so one day his, uh, uh, a bunch of reporters showed up at the door of the laboratory and he sent his spokesman out uh, while he hid in the closet somewhere because he really didn't want to talk to the reporters. He was a busy guy. Uh, so the reporter went out there and they kind of cornered this guy and the guy outright lied to them. He told them that Edison had already invented the light bulb. Well, of course, they spread it around the papers and it became a, a national sensation. Edison has invented the light bulb. Well, you know what had to happen to Edison? He had to go back several months later and said, no, I really didn't invent the light bulb yet, but we're working on it. Now, that's the, Christians can get in messes like that. Where we, you know, we say one thing, and, and, and we'll say, oh yeah, I got the light, and then you don't live like you got the light. Then the world comes around and they, they look at you and say, well, he ain't got the light. You need to live like you got the light. That way, and, and part, part of the way you do that is when the walking pestilence comes up to bother you, you see it coming and you can uh, be ready for it when it gets there and the world sees that and they says well you know he can see more than I can there's something in his life that I ain't got and God's pleased with that he is he's pleased with that but this walking pestilence um, I guess sometimes it can sneak up behind you 
but it's always walking towards you. And, and it, it gets you in times of darkness when, when you can't see very well. And then there's something that happens in the daylight. Notice that verse 6 uh, talks about uh, for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. So here is daylight destruction. Something that happens at 12 noon when the sun is high in the sky and it's bright and hot as it's going to get during the day and something destructive comes along. It, it, and, and notice it, it, it's very wasteful. It's very wasteful. You know, the devil wants you to waste your life. He wants you to waste your brain power. He wants you to waste your loves. He wants you to waste your time. He wants you to waste uh, all kinds of things that, that you have that you can use for God. The devil wants you wasting it. And he'll, he'll, he'll come up with a plan to get you to waste your time. Um, sometimes we don't know we're doing it. But mainly it comes from the long-term effects of sin we've allowed into our lives. Yeah. You know, some people stay away from big sins, but they let the little sins come into their life. Amen. And some of those little sins can be, over time, as destructive as the big sins. And right. we just don't notice that they're eating, 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 eating away at, at, at what we're doing. Isaiah 59 says, Behold the Lord's hand is not shortened. I read this this morning when I was reading my Bible that it cannot say neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Well that's good to know isn't it? Verse 2 but your iniquities have separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. You see that's an effect of sin on you where God is not really uh, God, God is hearing you, but he's really not paying attention to what you say. It's like he's going, la, 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 la. Get rid of that sin. La, 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 la. You understand? I haven't got rid of it yet. La, 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 la. And then you finally confess it and get rid of it. He says, okay, what, what it was that you wanted now? Amen? You say, how do you know how that happens? Because I've had it happen to me. I'm a sinner just like everybody else. Isaiah 59, 7 says, their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are the thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. Now, hopefully a Christian doesn't do any of that stuff, but I met a lot of Christians who had wasting and destruction in their paths. Uh, some people just can't seem to, to I, I don't know, they just, they, just, they just can't seem to get uh, things together for the Lord. Don't let that happen to you. If that ever starts happening to you, go to the Lord and say, Lord, I have a problem. And I don't know what's causing it. Show me what it is. And whatever it is, take care of it. He will show it to you. If you go to him with an honest heart. God never turned down anybody that went to him with an honest, uh, uh, heartfelt desire to be right and stay right with God. And then finally, that last verse Verse number 10 that we read. The plague in thy dwelling. The plague in thy dwelling. Well, say what is thy dwelling? Your house? No, it's talking about this right here. This is your dwelling. See, what is really you is your soul and your spirit. This is just a temporary housing. You're going to get a new one of these one day. And, and there's besetting sins that takes over your dwelling. It can be a plague in your dwelling. Uh, and it takes divine intervention sometimes to solve that plague in your dwelling. Uh, uh, if you go back to Leviticus 14, verse 34 and 35, um, it talks about the children of Israel. When ye become in the land of Cana, which I will give you for a possession, and I will... Put the plague of leprosy in the house of the land of your possession. He that owneth the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, It seemeth to me there is, as it were, a plague in the house. Now, uh, there's a lot of speculation on exactly what this is talking about. It calls it leprosy. Leprosy is the Bible name for any kind of thing uh, bad thing, be it disease in your body, 
or, or especially on your skin or something in a house or a garment or something that spreads. So I imagine this is something like mold or mildew or some kind of fungus that has taken up residence in someone's house. And as you know from after hurricanes and things, that can be very bad and unhealthy for people. Uh, they've got companies that will come and charge you a lot of money after these things and come and clean all that up out of your house. Amen? Now, if you have a little bit, just get you some Clorox after it and it'll be okay. But, you know, if it's covering the whole east side of your house, yeah, you may need to call somebody or else rip the east side of your house and replace it. I mean, I've seen people do that too. And, and, and actually, that's kind of a biblical uh, way of dealing with things. Um, verse 44 in the same chapter uh, talks about the, the priest. Uh, it says, Then the priest shall come and look. And behold, if the plague be spread in the house. So it's something like boulder, fungus, or mildew that spreads. Uh, it is a fretting leprosy in the house. It is unclean. Well, anybody would agree with that, now, even nowadays. Um, and he shall break down the house, the stones of it, and the timber thereof, and all the mortar of the house, and he shall carry them forth of the city into an unclean place. Uh, so in this case, if, if it's spread on the whole, they tear the whole house down. Now, so sometimes, um, like verse 48 says, Another priest shall come in and look upon it, and behold, the plague have not spread in the house. Uh, after the house was plastered. So he comes into the house and he finds a little bit of it and he chips out the plaster and he replasters it and he goes back in and he checks and see if it's still there and growing or if it's gone away. Uh, the plague is not spread in the house. After the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. So you have one case where the plague, no matter what they do, can't be healed, so they just tear the house down. And then you got the other case where they can fix it and, you know, tear out the bad parts and put the uh, good parts in. Well, so what does that got to do with a Christian life? Well, there's some parts of your life you need to kind of take out and put some new stuff in. Stuff that's just not good for you. And you say, well, what do you do? Just stop the stuff? No, you have to replace it with something. Nature does not like a vacuum. If, if, look, if you uh, uh, stop a bad habit, you need to come up with a good habit to put in its place. Not an equally bad habit. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a good habit. Uh, something that will take your mind and your heart off of whatever it is that had you kind of all, all, all uh, kind of uh, balled up. Now, we, we call this nowadays, we call this rot. Uh, this is probably some form of fungus. Uh, wood rot is, is a good example of uh, this kind of stuff in a house. Uh, you know, if you get some, if you have a, a wooden structure to your house and you start having, uh, uh, you know, rotten wood in your house, uh, it'll, it'll spread. Uh, you have to catch it rather quickly. Then they have uh, dry rot. They have indoor mold. Um, some fungus can cause major and minor sickness. Um, for instance, uh, there's things you may not know is a, uh, a, like a fungus or a mold. Uh, ringworm, uh, an athlete's foot, um, it is a form of, uh, it's a form of uh, fungus. And, and actually, it can cause major illness and even death if it's let go long enough. Um, you know, you have all kinds of things that cause lesions and bumps and boils and chronic ulcers. And uh, I'm sure all this stuff was included when the Bible talks about leprosy. Um, I'm not sure what leprosy in clothes was. Probably just some kind of moldy mildew or something. And that can get into clothes. So what do you do with moldy clothes? Mostly I throw them away. You try to wash them and wash them all that. Sometimes you can and sometimes you can't. Depends on how long the mold's been in there. I, I, I've washed st stuff like that that I've had mold. And I, I get it out of the dryer after it's washed a couple times and you know, and you pull out of the dryer and all you got to do is hold it up and smell it. And if it still smells moldy, you're not going to get it clean. 
you might as well just pitch it in the trash and go to the store and buy you some more. That's the way it is with sin sometimes. Sometimes you just have to, to kind of pitch away. Now, say, what can protect us about all this? Well, you know, the Bible talks about God like he's a, a suit of armor in some places. A shield and a buckler. A buckler was a, uh, a form of uh, a shield that some, some people felt it could be worn somehow or another. Um, armor has gone through a lot of history. Uh, the very first kind of armor was made of thick leather. You know, I, I mean, if you, uh, if you uh, stick a, like a butter knife uh, in, into someone's big, thick shoe leather, it's probably not going to do much. But if you poke it hard enough in your skin, it's going to, you know, it's going to cause a, a scrape or a cut or something. Uh, so they got the idea right quick. Well, leather may not be able to stop everything, but it'll stop a lot of things. Maybe slow down an arrow so it don't go in as far. And then uh, they came up with plate armor. The Romans uh, were uh, some of the first, uh, and, and actually some of the civilizations before. A lot of them wore just breastplates. The Romans wore breastplates and armor over their legs and partly down their arms. And, of course, they had metal helmets. And, uh, of course, uh, the Chinese... Uh, they invented what they call uh, scaled armor, which looked like fish scales that were made of metal. And the advantage of the Chinese armor is you could move in it pretty easily. Um, other armor was made of one sheet of something that was pounded into a shape, and, and it, it kind of was hard unless you had lots of joints, and then there was places for the arrows to get in there too. Um, and even the Aztecs and... Uh, uh, America, the early Aztecs, in the 1300s, they invented metal armor. Of course, I don't know where this metal armor went to when uh, Cortez and all the uh, Spanish came uh, a couple centuries later. Um, Chainmail was invented in 300 B.C. by the Celts, and the Romans saw it and they copied it. And, uh, of course, you know that they wore chainmail during the Middle Ages. Um, then suits of armor came along. And, of course, uh, you've seen these pictures of the, the knight in shining armor. You know, well, some of it was and some of it wasn't. Uh, and that was a big rage from the 1300s to the 1500s. But they invented this little thing called gunpowder and bullets. And that kind of stopped the metal armor because you could shoot through someone's old tin can and the bullets uh, wouldn't even slow down. So... Uh, they dumped the armor, and uh, they didn't do much of anything for a long time. And then somebody, and I'm not sure who, but they invented stuff like Kevlar. And now they have Kevlar. And uh, your policemen, a lot of your FBI agents, people like that, they, they wear this Kevlar armor under their clothes. It's very thin, but it will stop bullets. And uh, God is like any of this stuff. You, you can just... Plug God into any of what I just described. He's our shield. He's our armor. The Bible says in Romans 13, he's the armor of light. In 2 Corinthians 6, he's the armor of righteousness. Um, in Ephesians 6, we're to put on the armor of God. He told Abraham way back in Genesis 15, I am my shield. Now, if he said that to Abraham, what do you think his children mean to him? You are a child of God. And although the devil may send all these bombs and spiritual explosives on your head and you may be crouched down in the foxhole of your life, uh, you know, trying to figure out when the bombardment's going to stop, God is there protecting you. And all you have to do is trust in Him. And you know the wonderful thing about armor is that in the day you could go forward and fight. And that's what God wants us to do is go for not to carry on a hole somewhere, but go out and fight. He will protect you. He will protect you.